Why? It was week in, week out, you had it. Just about gas, 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 you know. Just because you got a reported explosive situation below you, it doesn't mean that you haven't got to sort of get on with your daily grind as far as work and living is concerned. Hello and welcome to Southern Eye. It was the biggest peacetime operation of its kind, the evacuation of an entire street because of fears about the toxic dump it was built on. This week, work has begun so families can move back into Lumsden Road in Portsmouth. Contaminated land can affect anything from the state of our health to the value of our homes. Yet three years after the Lumsden Road scare, Southern Eye has discovered evidence that it's a problem most local authorities in the region are failing to address. The government, too, stands accused of inaction. Lisa Orsden investigates the legacy of living on poisoned earth. The King visits Portsmouth in 1937 to review his fleet amassed in the Solent, an awesome power which would soon be in combat again. Half a century on, the legacy of that age would have a profound effect on dozens of families forced from their homes with a warning that the earth beneath their feet was putting their health at risk. If I had known that when I accepted this property, I would have certainly have asked questions and made sure that it was safe for my children before I moved here. They should not leave families with young children on a state like this. They're on a time bomb. For two and a half years, dozens of much-needed homes have stood deserted in Lumsden Road at Eastney in Portsmouth, fenced off and boarded up, the ground poisoned by asbestos and heavy metals. Just how many contaminated sites there may be in Britain, nobody knows. There could be as many as 100,000. Some undoubtedly present a health risk. Finding them can be a matter of chance. Arthur Mack knew Lumsden Road before it was built on, a dumping ground for the Navy, before there were controls, before there was a clear appreciation of the dangers. We used to come down to the actual ferry where my boat was moored. We used to call it the dirt road because it was a bumpy road, one built up road. And there used to be the glory hall, that's where the, the dockyard tip was, where they used to tip all the actual rubbish out of the dockyard, um, asbestos tins of uh, anti-fouling paints, uh, used to be mercury as well, heavy metals, lots and lots of copper wire, and um, all the actual junk from the dockyard. Did you used to go rooting around to get stuff out? I or? did in the early days, you know, uh, helped you with your fishing or whatever, earn a few shillings, yes. By the 1960s, the glory hole had all but disappeared. Over it, the Ministry of Defence built homes for Navy families. Piecing together a computerised history is only part of the task of seeking out contaminated land. Portsmouth has problems greater than most. Large areas of the city are reclaimed from the sea, filled with rubbish. Environmental health officers are trying to find every site, a job which will take five years and cost six million pounds. So far, the money has come from grants, but there are no guarantees in future. I think most urban areas have got a history of contamination. Some are trying to tackle it with fairly limited resources. Uh, others are trying to uh, close their eyes to the situation, I think, because they don't have the resources to deal with the problem and they realise the impact that it's going to have uh, in terms of economic development and concern for the local populace uh, if they do, in fact, start uh, investigating the problem in a, a more vigilant way. In the heart of high-tech Basingstoke, a home grower's haven survives. When I retired, a couple of years later, I uh, was getting fat, you know, I thought it would be a good idea to get allotment and uh, work some of it off. I did too, I'm only about 46 now around the waist. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? It's lovely to get out on a nice evening and, and just do some gardening or just pot around in the soil. I, I just like getting my fingers into the soil and doing a bit of digging. 
But recently, heavy machinery has churned the soil on the allotments at East Rock, creating new plots while others are taken out of use. The earth which has nurtured some prize-winning produce came under suspicion. It was a surprise more than a shock, you know, because um, Basingstoke is such a clean town. I mean, I was born in the Midlands where, where there's plenty of muck about, you know, and, and it was such a shock to, to think that there was um, uh, things in the soil that we didn't know about. Before the allotments were created some 40 years ago, the site was a dumping ground for all sorts. Dredgings from the canal, Second World War gas masks, and most significantly slag from the Wallace and Stevens foundry, famous for its steamrollers. The waste was mixed with the soil in the belief it would enrich it. Signs of heavy metal contamination only came to the attention of Basingstoke Council when consultants tested the soil on a neighbouring site earmarked for construction of a new YMCA building. I was over here when they were digging a trial pit on uh, my, one of my plots in February, and of course they go down a, a good two metres, so it's a very long way, but all sorts of sort of nasty looking things were coming up, but um, you know, I, I couldn't really, uh, uh, as, long as, I, as far as I'm concerned, I think as long as the top soil is all right, I'm assuming, but of course I have got to give up those worst affected areas. But old habits die hard. Despite the contamination, Tony Jupe still eats fruit and veg from his plot. Frank West is doing the same, even though the council told allotment holders to stop eating their produce when the problems first arose. Soon, Frank has to up sticks, leaving behind an allotment established over years. Parsnips and beetroot are still down there. I haven't dug them up. They thought I put a bit of a scare in this, about this poisoning in there. David Clapham could hardly believe his bad luck. He has his work cut out after moving plots no less than three times in the last couple of years. Allotments are used for people to grow their vegetables on, so it shouldn't be contaminated. You know, people shouldn't dump or people should know what is here. We don't actively go around the borough looking for contamination sites. You don't? Not actively, but if any are brought to our attention or we know of any areas where there may be concern, naturally we'd go and test those straight away. So how much does the council know about contaminated land in the Basingstoke area? I think in Basingstoke we're quite fortunate. I don't think we're in a position where we've got major contamination problems within the borough. So from that point of view, we're very fortunate. But how do you know if you're not going out and doing the testing? Right, from the tests we have done in the past where areas have been brought to our knowledge, there's been uh, little contamination at all. Basingstoke is not alone. Southern Eye has discovered that three out of four councils in the region are not compiling registers of contaminated land which the public can see. We contacted more than 50. Only these 12 are making any attempt to seek out trouble spots. When the government abandoned its plans for a register, most councils followed suit. As it turns out, most of the Basingstoke allotments were free of contamination. There's actually very little evidence of ill health from contaminated land. Nevertheless, one has to take uh, a prudent approach and do one's best to reclaim it in a way that's satisfactory for human health and for the environment. Dame Barbara Clayton is Henri Research Professor in Metabolism at Southampton University. In the 60s, she was among the authors of a definitive study on the effects of lead in children. In Derbyshire, where there have been lead mining for generations, though the soil is high in lead, the level of lead in the children's blood is quite normal. Um, in Shipham, in the West Country, where there had been very old mines um, for zinc and lead, uh, and where cadmium was also a contaminant, the population there are exposed to high levels of cadmium in the soil. Uh, there was no evidence that they were being harmed by this, and a very careful study was done. Several studies have supported the view that the risks in Lumsden Road were real, in particular to children. But tests have shown no immediate signs of harmful effects, reinforcing a view that the council overreacted, the publicity of the evacuation causing more damage than any health scare. 
At Langston Marina, next to Lumsden Road, prices fell, and some discovered that their homes too were built on formerly contaminated land. The developers carried out extensive work and made it safe before any homes were built. Tony Winnicott says any chance of selling his marina home died with the Lumsden Road affair, as did any feeling of community as families moved out of the marina. Majority of them, they had children born here, or young children, and as soon as the cry went up, they were gone. You know, the wives wouldn't have it, so which is probably obvious. You think of children, you've got to protect them, I suppose. And the only way to protect them is move out. How do you feel about living here now? Well, I hate it here, but uh, I've got no option, really. You know, I can't sell it. It'll never sell. Ironically, blight was at the heart of the government's decision to scrap the contaminated land register, fearing it would blight property values across the country. Critics believe the decision favoured property tycoons, not individuals. When you buy a house, the onus is on you to discover its history. The legal term is caveat emptor, buyer beware. But even if the property is built on contaminated land, you may never know until it's too late. The document which should help us discover the history of a house is plainly out of date, asking an irrelevant question about a register which does not exist. According to a former senior government scientist, even if you do discover the worst, getting compensation may be impossible. Even if they can um, take some legal action, it's very expensive, and uh, it can take many years to actually come to uh, fruition. And in the meantime, they may not be able to sell the house um, and the house is actually valueless, because no one will lend money on it, no one will buy it. When it's known about, it can be managed, harnessed even, to produce energy for the national grid. But methane, one of the gases produced by rotting domestic rubbish, can be extremely dangerous. It looks like a piece of precision bombing. A family asleep inside walked from the wreckage of their bungalow. I've never seen one like this before, and certainly I've never seen one like this where the people have got out uninjured or mi with minor injuries. It's absolutely unbelievable. The villain of the piece was methane, seeping underground from a nearby rubbish tip. It's reckoned there are 1,400 potentially explosive landfill sites in Britain. The trigger level for an explosion can be extremely low, just 5%. These readings at Ashford in Kent four years ago brought drastic action. A row of council houses built over a landfill site in the 60s was demolished. Tenants were rehoused, but the community spirit was gone. Oh, it was nice, a nice atmosphere. You know, all the neighbours got on together. You couldn't, you couldn't wish for a better street. And I said, all of a sudden, they come down and go bang and cut everything in half. Our initial view was that um, the great sensitivity would be to health and safety and particularly the very emotive issue of, of methane gas explosion within the house. Uh, in fact, our experience at Ashford showed that to be lower down their levels of concerns. The main concern that most people had was property valuation and blight and, and that came over very, very strongly. Today, grass grows where the council houses stood. Gravel marks the site of a trench designed to stop methane migrating any further. Just beyond the landfill site, some private homes remain, but their owners asked us not to show them. Methane has never been found inside, but the oxygen of publicity has blighted them. It was like you were tied down, you know what I mean? Suddenly, you couldn't do anything, you couldn't go anywhere. The council ruled you. I think they should have moved in and said to the people, I mean, there's only four hours it's left. So we take them over and we knock the things down. They knock the other eight down, so what can they do this for? But councils have neither power nor money to compensate for blight, unlike other countries like Denmark. Ashford Council went on to find methane problems at 40 sites around the town. That's a borehole there. What they did was they, uh, they inserted a plastic pipe. Ted Swinburne suspected there was methane inside his council bungalow in Ashford, built, he thinks, over a dump for bricks and tiles. When the council came to test outside, he tells of inviting them in, gas detector at the ready. And as Jim comes in the bathroom, the thing goes berserk. I said, what's the matter there? 
Oh, she said, oh, something's wrong with the machine. So she steps back, goes outside, comes back in again. She says, oh, she says, there's a, there's a lot here. And she searches round, and she goes round the pipes, round the top, and round the, to the shower. She says, it's coming round somewhere, I don't know where. So she says, try something for me, and I'll get, and come back tomorrow. So she says, would you put the plug in the sink? Fill up the holes and overflow. Like so. And then make sure the vent was closed. And then put the trap down on the toilet seat. And then put something over, such as a sponge. And then a flannel over the top of that so that it wouldn't move. So what did you make of all this, Ted? Well, I thought I, I was, the gas got to me and I was crazy trying to listen to the stupidity. There's your cheese wheel. Thank you. The result of this bizarre elimination process was a clean bill of health. The council points out that its detectors are so sensitive they can react to any number of household gases. An aerosol could affect it. All the same, Ted and his wife Betty have been unnerved. They get out of the house as much as they can and have asked the council to move them. So far, to no avail. Just round the corner, John Patterson also tells a tale of some strange goings on. Remember, methane is explosive at very low levels. The results of tests outside his home rang alarm bells. Specialist kit duly arrived. It was quite a big bit of equipment, and it had a burner on the, on the top of it. For, and my understanding, I could be quite wrong here, but there was a sort of a heat shimmer above, uh, um, you know, the, uh, there was a chimney thing with a, a sort of a heat hose above it. And I must admit that you couldn't quite see a flame there, but it, uh, I understood that the methane was actually being measured as it was being, um, uh, I, I suppose, as it was seeping from the ground and was being burnt off to dispose of it. The discovery of methane knocked property prices here, but confidence is returning. Residents were told gravel trenches might be put around the footings of each house and that they would have to pay. The council is said to have mentioned a figure of £1,200 a household. I thought it was a bit thick, you know, in that, um, you know, that they're involved very, very closely with the consent, you know, of the building of these things, and uh, they have public responsibilities, and yet they were trying to, you know, push the... Uh, you know, the expense of our door. In the end, the council paid for the solution, which was much cheaper and hardly noticeable. Lamp posts were customised to let methane escape into the atmosphere. Spinning cows draw gas from the ground, wafting it harmlessly into the air. This is state-of-the-art methane management. Port Solent Marina was created largely from the waters surrounding Portsmouth. The houses are built on chalk gouged from Portsdown Hill, not like the commercial sector on top of a former rubbish tip. All the buildings uh, along this, this area here have got um, voids beneath the floor slabs. Uh, within those voids there are, are monitors for gas, uh, which will tell us to very great accuracy just what the constituents of the air is under there. There are fans in there that extract the air uh, to a, a given a rate all day long. Uh, they've also got a capacity to kick in at a, a double rate uh, were any gas to build up there. Um, and also, uh, right along the perimeter of the development, there's also a, a seven, eight metre deep trench in there uh, with a gas-proof membrane to actually stop any gas coming in from the existing landfill. Overcoming the dangers of methane is expensive, but nowadays developers have little choice. Planning authorities will send them back to the drawing board unless measures to deal with contaminated land are built into designs. Environmental engineers like Andrew Limage are called upon increasingly to find new uses for derelict land, what they call brownfield sites. Greenfield sites are, are, are running out very fast, um, more and more of the green areas are being protected. Um, old industrial areas fall into decline, uh, and if you don't regenerate them, then you, you end up with an awful lot of dereliction. Um, it's it's got to be the way forward, and it, it done properly, it can be done very successfully. 
Caroline Checkley is a specialist from the environmental section of Harwell, the Atomic Energy Authority. She makes regular visits to Port Solent to check methane levels. Today, as is usual, she finds no trace. Caroline's time is expensive. She gets involved assessing the risks on land earmarked for redevelopment. A survey can run into many thousands of pounds and throw up problems some would prefer not to hear. Many developers may say, oh well, you know, we'll go for a cheaper option, which means, say, looking at half of the site, only analysing some of the soils, not conducting a full gas survey, so you don't get a whole picture of the site. I mean, it's very easy to miss out areas of the land if you don't investigate the whole site. Maidenhead in Berkshire, a pleasant spot by the Thames, a prime residential area. One developer who's well known in the Maidenhead property market has failed to forward one particular project. Michael Shanley's company was accused by the local council at a public inquiry of failing to follow government guidance when it put forward plans for some 200 homes at Badnell's Tip. Once a gravel working, then a dump for waste from a trading estate, the tip harbours dozens of pollutants, asbestos to name but one. How can it be made safe? There's only two ways of doing it, and that is either capping it with concrete and building houses on top of it, not a very comfortable place to live, and secondly, by removing it. By removing it to where? To other people's tips. Uh, I don't want it here, but I certainly wouldn't want to inflict it on anybody else in the south of England. The developer has now agreed with the council to call in environmental scientists to assess the risks on site, a survey which is costing Mr Shanley tens of thousands of pounds. Previous reports suggest some 40 contaminants are present here. Methane is certainly one of them. The developer has changed his plan and is now hoping for permission to build 90 homes, a superstore and a petrol station. The thing about a petrol station is you have to be careful there anyhow because there will be flammable vapours from the petroleum products in, in the tanks. Uh, the methane really is, is probably a far lesser problem. And on this particular site, um, whereas with a normal landfill site, you would have something like 60% of methane coming out of the ground. Here we've only got 5 or 6%, much, much less. And in fact, that's only in, 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 odd, in odd spots. So it, it really isn't the sort of risk or threat that you would get from a, a big gassing landfill site. The consultants will produce a land quality statement at the end of their work. It's something the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors is pushing for in all such cases. The effect on water is a principal concern here, though initial tests show little sign of contamination. Just as councils rely on developers for soil tests, the water regulators are in a similar position. Our role tends to be quite reactive, rather than being able to go out and, and look at sites and think, oh yes, we want to investigate that. It's very much as, as things come up for redevelopment or as the site owner themselves decides that they've got a problem on their site and comes to it, but then we seek to go forward on it. A modest trickle at this time of year, the River Loddon runs close to an aquifer supplying Basingstoke with three million gallons of water a day. It's also close to an industrial giant of the past. Local legend has it that they stopped the clock at the moment the factory last fell silent. Today, it stands empty. Its fate tied in with designs for a new superstore for Basingstoke. Thornycrofts was famous for its big vehicles, in its heyday providing employment for 2,000 in the town. When war broke out, the workforce turned its talents to the production of munitions. So this is much higher than it was in years gone by? Oh yes, it was, it was same level as we are now when I was a child or when I was in my teenage. And what's happened is that they've dumped all this uh, industrial waste over the years. Arthur Atwood, a Thornycroft man for 18 years, recalls how the leftovers of the production process were dumped out back. Part of that process involved cyanide. When the cyanide lost a lot of its uh, value, so it would still be dangerous, I imagine. They had to get rid of it. And what else could they do? But they would have dumped it here with all the rest of the other industrial waste. Arthur's theory was borne out in the early 70s, when a canister of spent cyanide was found during the building of a new road. Thankfully, no trace has ever been found in the water supply, which is monitored constantly. Though maps have a certain value, it's widely acknowledged that research into contaminated land should tap into the minds of a dwindling generation, the likes of Arthur Atwood, who remember it for real.
At Walston near Southampton, new private housing estates have names like Sandpiper and Waterside. A few years ago, the scene was very different. The Ministry of Defence was selling up its Navy stores depot, a site deemed unfit for human habitation. Waste disposal experts were called in to clean up land used for a munitions dump, a foundry and a power station. The council described it as a horrifying picture and demanded measures were taken. The poisoned soil was shipped out by the lorry load, the operation carefully monitored throughout. It cost the developers millions, way above estimates. All concerned are now satisfied the site is safe, the houses are built on pristine soil shipped in at enormous expense. Yet the solution for Lumsden Road in Portsmouth is modest by comparison. This test area shows a horizontal fence which will be spiked into the grass, covered with clean topsoil and turfed to effectively cage the problems below. The site will be monitored for wear and tear. No one sees it as a long-term solution, though the architects are confident. As long as it is covered, everybody is perfectly safe. And we and all the fellow consultants working on this believe that the scheme that we're proposing uh, produces a, a, a good level of safety, in fact, an excellent level of safety. If we're looking 20 or 30 years hence, and the buildings could well still be there over that sort of time scan, scale, I would certainly would have wanted to see more done. But I have to accept that that's the approach that's being adopted. Um, and in view of the fact that it meets the EPA requirements and I'm satisfied that it will remove any risk to the, uh, the public health, I, I, I'm happy about the circumstances as it stands today. The Lumsden Road flats have new owners, a company called Pantheon, who say tenants are queuing to move in. The price paid for the site is a secret, though it was certainly knocked down by the Ministry of Defence to take account of the problems. There can be no doubt about the cause of the pollution here, but the MOD thinks it unfair to have to take the blame for the consequences of defending the country. Even so, it is planning to have similar remedial work done around Navy homes close to Lumsden Road. This, they say, is to allay any fears and not an admission that any danger exists. Coping with contamination does not come cheap. This project is to clear high methane levels from allotments on the site of a former rubbish tip in Portsmouth. The bill will be almost three quarters of a million pounds, a cost which so often falls to the taxpayer in the absence of the polluter. While many of our European partners press on with finding contaminated land and addressing the issue of liability, the government here has yet to come up with a firm policy. Where councils have been vigilant and found problems, it's often of no comfort to those entangled in the consequences, like Sid Parmenter and his neighbours in Ashford. Well, for, so for all the stress and everything they, they gave us, put us through, and the publicity they you know, gave us, I think that someone should have come down and said, well, helped us out somewhere, give us someone we could have talked to. I think it's made some people not bad in health, but it's, it's not done their health any good. It was week in, week out, you had it. Just about gas, 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 you know. I thought I knew more about gas than what they did. <laughs> So what should be done to protect homeowners from blight? Who should pay for the cleanup when the polluter is long gone? Call me now on 0703 631 316 and join the debate on your BBC local radio station in Southern Eye Sound. But from Southern Eye, good night.